So in my earlier videos of the H2D printer, I gave you a lot of details about how awesome the printer was. Great prints, fast prints, and some pretty cool magic with the dual nozzle extruder. I've also been documenting all of the issues I've encountered for the past several months. Issues with the printer itself, the attached AMS, and the larger Bamboo Lab ecosystem included. In this video, I want to share my real world experience, the problems I've run into, how many times I've run into them, and in some cases, solutions for the problems. Some things I've solved and others not so much. I bought this printer with my own money and honestly, with a lot of hesitation. It's new to the market, it's expensive, and I just didn't know how reliable the printer would be. I'm here to give you a fair and realistic look at a comprehensive list of issues that I encountered over the past several months. To give you a clear look at what you might be getting into if you purchase the H2D. Is it still worth it after all these months? Let's find out. I do most of my printing with ABS and PAHT prints, but when I tried to do PLA or PETG or other low temperature filaments, that need the cooling fan, I noticed how loud the cooling fan actually is. I shut the printer door, I shut the storage room door, and I shut the door going down to the storage room, and I can still hear it around the house. It's like listening to your neighbor two doors down running an electric leaf blower. TPU. TPU is not the H2D's strong suit. Bamboo Lab did come up with a TPU for AMS that does feed quite well into the AMS and produces very nice prints. The problem is it's just not very flexible. I tried to use it on the Cyberbrick forklift kit for the treads, and it's kind of like creating treads out of a frozen garden hose. It's still useful though for some prints, such as a belt that I've designed. You can find that link in the description below. Scratch resistant parts such as a phone cradle so that you have a nice or a relatively soft surface for your phone to rest up against. Or for other devices that need just a little bit more damage tolerance that PLA may not provide. So what's the issue? Well, if you want to go for softer TPU, you really have to go through some shenanigans to get it working in your printer, including removing the top, unattaching the PTFE tube, and feeding the filament directly into your printer from AMS that is lined up with the top of your printer. It's quite the hassle to get that softer TPU capability. Another point about TPU. Even with the H2D's ooze guard, you still have some problems with TPU getting where it shouldn't. It's not the end of the world if you don't need perfect aesthetics, but about one in three prints, I end up with TPU someplace where I didn't intend it to be. Next up, ASA. I truthfully haven't done a lot of printing with ASA, but the one print that I did do, the ASA actually tore off part of the print bed. I didn't try to remove it until the print bed was room temperature, but I wonder if there isn't something that I did wrong here or if the printer calibrated wrong with the ASA because of the damage that it left behind. Maybe I should have used a glue stick. I just haven't had a chance to look into it yet. If you have any thoughts about this issue, please leave them in the comments below. Next up, a little bit about the AMS. While it's not technically the H2D, it's almost like a necessary accessory to the H2D. When I used cardboard spools in the AMS, towards the end of the spool where it started getting lighter, it would jump out of the rollers and actually cause extruder motor overload errors on the H2D. This happened four or five times before I eventually gave up on that spool and loaded a fresh spool. I know there's fixes for this. You can get some rings to snap onto your cardboard spool or just roll your spool onto a plastic spool. It's just more hassle that I just don't want to deal with. Continuing on with the AMS and spools, if you want to get a plastic spool, Bamboo Lab has a great assortment of filaments, also reasonably priced. And those spools come with an RFID chip so that when you load them in, the AMS can automatically know what type of filament you loaded. The problem is that it takes three or four days for that filament to arrive after you order it. In a day and age where Amazon can ship same day, this seems like an awful long time to wait around for the next filament spool to come in. And I just don't like living with a lot of extra inventory. As it is, I end up using cardboard spools or non-bamboo lab spools from time to time because of the convenience of driving down the road to Micro Center 
or ordering it from Amazon. Next up is parts availability. If you go to bamboolab.com and look for parts for the H2D, you see a random assortment of parts. It just seems to depend on the day what's available. It's kind of like going to a swap meet. You don't really know what you're going to get when you get on that site. Basic parts like the print nozzles, print beds, or even the AMSHT can be hard to come by. What's in stock on bamboolab.com seems to change daily, and that's a little unsettling for long-term ownership. Cloud connectivity glitch. And I say glitch singular because I've had one of them. The software was not able to send my model to the printer. This is very concerning because it was one of my first few bad experiences with the H2D. Luckily that has only occurred once and it was remedied by putting the model onto a USB drive and plugging the USB drive into the printer. Next up, missing onboard storage. I don't understand why a printer in 2025 does not have onboard storage for things like models and video recording. It's so cheap to come by these days and instead you have to use a USB port and a USB thumb drive to store such things is a little weird to me, especially because you may snag that USB drive and do damage to the USB drive or the printer or both. Filament breaks. I had one instance where the filament actually broke between the buffer and the extruder head. I didn't know this happened and when I kept trying to load new filament into the extruder, it simply wouldn't work. Eventually found out that it was in fact a broken piece of filament inside the feed tube. Once I found this out, it was a relatively simple matter of disconnecting the tube and then just simply pulling out the broken filament. Next up is right left nozzle slicing limitations. I understand that the right nozzle can't get as far to the left as the left nozzle and vice versa because of the geometry of the printer. But if I slice the model such that my primary material is on the left extruder and my support material is on the right extruder, if sometime later I decide to reprint that model, but I happen to have the filaments reversed, I have to re-slice that model. This seems like a simple thing that Bamboo Lab could overcome, but as of right now, you have to re-slice your model if you change the position of your materials that's all for the issues. Now we're actually going to look at specifically the prints that failed on me. So PLA and PETG were my problem filaments. On the flip side of that, PAHT, carbon fiber, ABS, and ASA were rock solid having not failed any prints for those three filaments. It's odd because PLA and PETG are typically understood to be a little bit easier to print with than those other materials. Thankfully, the bulk of my printing is with ABS or PHT carbon fiber. If this isn't the case for you, I hope there's some type of troubleshooting or some way to improve the reliability of the PLA and the PETG printing. I've noticed a lot of YouTubers out there with videos explaining how the cooling mechanism or the cooling flow might be the culprit here or perhaps the print bed temperature needs to be adjusted. Okay, so a great example between ABS and PLA. I had a large glow-in-the-dark candy bowl shaped like vampire teeth. When I printed this with ABS, it printed flawlessly three times. I ran out of ABS filament that was glow-in-the-dark, so I switched over to PLA. So I re-sliced with the PLA settings and started printing. And unfortunately, the print started lifting up from the print bed, so much so that it started impacting the movement of the nozzle in a way that actually had the machine end up doing some kind of recalibration maneuver over and over again. You can actually audibly hear the nozzle ramming into the print from upstairs. I tried several things to get the PLA print to succeed, including drying the filament, cleaning the print bed, and also leaving the print bed door open None of this succeeded, and after three attempts of printing this PLA-based candy bowl, I gave up and ordered some more ABS. I had fun making this candy bowl in Fusion. If you want to download the model, you can check out the links below, and you can resize it to any size that you want. Next up is print bed adhesion issue with a realistic horse that I downloaded from Maker World. I wanted to print this off for my daughter, 
However, after four attempts, I gave up trying. The issue was that the tail had a small attachment point on the print bed, such that it continuously broke off at about the same point every print. I ultimately gave up trying pet G, perhaps increasing the size of the brim or adding a raft to this model would have worked better. The silver lining? Well, the H2D was able to detect that the tail had dislodged from the print bed and alerted me every single time. So at least I didn't waste filament beyond that point where the tail broke off. Next up with small parts and print bed adhesion, I tried to print the Cyberbrick controller all in one go on the H2D. I did this twice and each time the small joystick knob broke off from the print bed. To resolve this, I simply deleted it from the full model, printed the full model, and then just printed the joystick knob by itself. Not a huge issue and to some extent probably could be remedied by a larger brim or a raft. This sounds like a lot, but remember, this is after several months of printing with this 3D printer almost daily. And for that much runtime, it's not all that bad. I do have some concerns with PLA and PETG, but I'm willing to bet, based on the YouTube videos that I've seen from other makers, that the problems are overcomable. We looked at the issues from the printer and failed prints, but there's other issues, the human element. And that's where the H2D really shined for me through this past several months. In other words, when I put in a wrong nozzle, put a wrong print bed in, or put wrong filament in, the H2D is capable and has saved me from starting prints with that incorrect hardware and filament installed. So it really saved me a failed print on multiple occasions. So while the H2D is not flawless, it is a smart and capable printer. So would I still recommend the H2D printer after all these months of printing? Yes, but with eyes wide open. This is a phenomenal printer, but it does have its issues. If you've had other issues with your H2D or AMS combo, let me know in the comments below. I'd be really curious to know how your experiences have aligned or not aligned with my experiences. I'm particularly curious about the folks that use the printer for a lot of PLA or PETG, especially with the H2C coming down the line, how it's going to fare with users that may be wanting to use multiple colors of PLA for printing. That's all for today. If you liked the video, feel free to subscribe and we look forward to seeing you in the next video.